Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Ellie Johnston. I'm the Climate and Energy Lead at Climate Interactive. Really excited to have you all joining us today. I think uh, we're in for a good webinar. Uh, see some familiar faces. Welcome back. If you've been joining us each Thursday and maybe some new people too, welcome. If you're just joining, uh, great to see you all. All right. Uh, so if you're just, just joining, why not in the chat, put your name, where you're coming from. I'm sure we have people coming from all over the place. I am uh, talking to you all from Truckee, California. It's a little smoky here this morning. Uh, we've got forest fires that I'm sure many of you all have been reading about in the news, uh, just to the north and south. Um, lots of people working hard to put those out. Uh, all right, where are people coming from today? I see Largo, Florida, Orleans, Massachusetts, Columbus, Ohio, Cairo, Egypt, North Carolina, Southern California, Monterey, Mexico. Glad to hear it's sunny in Germany, Scotland, Ottawa, Canada, Singapore, Minnesota, Toronto, Canada, uh, Houston, Texas, Massachusetts, Belgium, Maryland, Boise, Idaho, uh, India, India, uh, Germany, Hanover, New Hampshire, um, somebody else from Germany, Regenda coming from Nepal, Atlanta, Georgia, Mexico. Oh, so great to see you all. Winnipeg, Canada, Cambridge, Massachusetts, Arkansas. Uh, that's great to hear. Lots of people coming in from Germany today. Great to have you all joining. Uh, Arlington, Virginia, Nigeria, Athens, Georgia, British Columbia, uh, Argentina, St. Louis, Missouri, San Antonio, India. Great to have you all joining. Um, why don't we start with just a big hello. Uh, we're gonna unmute everyone all at once. Say hello in your favorite language. Hello, everyone. Hello. 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 Love it. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> all right. That was great. Uh, it's so good to see you all. I, I, I know that some of you all have mentioned how you have enjoyed these meetings as it's just we're coming together from so many different places and uh, so it's great to see you all. Thanks, thanks for joining today. Um, so at this point, um, we are going to hear from our speakers. Our speakers today will be Beth Sawin, who's the co-director of Climate Interactive, and Cassandra Sabriz Ceballos, who uh, works on our multi-solving program. They're going to be talking about using inroads to make connections to health, equity, justice, and well-being. So, just a few notes about the platform uh, before we jump into things. Um, if you have any questions, comments, feel free to write them into the chat. We have several people from our team uh, that will be on the chat and can answer questions as we go uh, while we're listening to the speakers. Also, we get questions about this each time, but you can save the chat. If you're one of those people who wants to just focus on the speakers and it's too distracting to watch the chat at the same time, you can save it at the end um, and then read through it after afterwards. Um, if you have more detailed questions, um, something that you're, you're looking for, you can send us a ticket at support.climateinteractive.org. You can also just email us at support at climateinteractive.org and that will come to our support platform. And uh, we'll get back to you within a few days uh, with, with uh, answers to your questions. Um, all right. And then uh, today we will also be using um, the platform Poll Everywhere. If you've joined some of the previous uh, sessions, uh, you will be familiar with this. Uh, we'll let you know and put the link into the chat when it's time to fill out uh, the poll. But just as a note, we will be using Poll of dot com slash climate inter 935 uh, today. All right, next slide. So here we are just within the uh, big picture of the training program. So we have gone through several different training modules so far. Um, you can go to learn.climateinteractive.org 
to find the previous recordings of the live sessions. And of course, all of the videos, the quizzes, uh, the material that's associated with these live events. So do um, look back and make sure to go through those previous videos and quizzes if you haven't already. Um, those, that's where the, really the heart of the content is. Um, and we'll be speaking to some of those things uh, today and um, in future, future sessions. So keep that in mind. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Dr. Beth Sawin at this point. She's gonna give you an overview of what, uh, what's contained in the, in the workshop today and uh, take it from there. Thanks. Thanks, Ellie, and hi, everyone. Um, it's really great to be here talking about one of my favorite things, which is multi-solving. Um, and I'm gonna be joined and pass the mic back and forth with my colleague, Cassandra Ceballos, as Ellie mentioned. So Cassandra is the multi-solving program coordinator at Climate Interactive, and you'll see her work in some of the case studies we're gonna look at and in places in En-ROADS where there's tips about multi-solving co-benefits and equity, Cassandra um, really led the effort to, to make sure that that was there for you. So today we're gonna do five different things. Um, we're gonna start by just talking about what is multi-solving. Um, then we'll look at some examples of them, of multi-solving. Um, we want to quickly turn though to how to connect multi-solving and equity, which is a core part of multi-solving into En-ROADS. We'll have some time in breakout groups to play around with some of the ideas. And then we'll come back for another round uh, through connections between multi-solving and En-ROADS and how to bring it into your facilitation. Um, I know I, I heard uh, that you all had a pretty fun time last week. Those of you who are at last week's live meetup webinar. Um, it was a bit of a game show extravaganza from what I heard. Um, we're not going to be in that quite that same mode today, but I do hope it will feel upbeat to you. Um, one of the great things about multi-solving is it's a really nice counterpoint to some of the harder messages that you're delivering to people as an En-ROADS climate ambassador. Like you may be holding someone in their first real understanding of the challenges that we're up against or the speed and scale of change or climate impacts that are already happening. Um, with multi-solving, you get to also help people begin to imagine what can get better in the world by virtue of how we address climate change. So you get to tap into vision and possibility. Um, you also get to customize your presentations for your particular audience because climate change touches so many things. Um, by bringing multi-solving in, you'll be able to uh, entice folks who are interested in health or jobs or equity and justice as well as climate change. Um, and you can also use multi-solving to build alliances because you start to be able to see all the other constituencies who also benefit from addressing climate change. So those are some of the reasons why we're gonna take a full hour today to talk about multi-solving, but it really is all in service of you making a difference using En-ROADS. Um, so here's how we define multi-solving. We think about solutions that are rooted in justice that pr produce co-benefits in health, resilience, and well-being, while also protecting the climate. So this whole hour, we're gonna talk about the many, many things that reduce greenhouse gas emissions or build resilience or both, um, while also producing other benefits like health, equity, biodiversity protection. Um, you can think of multi-solving as one action that leads to multiple solutions. So here's a really simple example. Um, most people are familiar with this, that if we were to burn less coal, not only do we protect climate for the long term because we reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but in the short term, we also improve people's health because coal is such an important source of air pollution and air pollution leads to so many problems from respiratory and cardiovascular illness to stroke, premature birth and many other issues. In fact, um, the World Health Organization has said that the health benefits of getting off of fossil fuels in general and coal in particular um, are so large that the costs of climate action are really balanced out by the health savings. Not all climate solutions are created equal though when it comes to the co-benefits, when it comes to multi-solving. Um, and here's one example from a modeling study that was in the Lancet uh, some years ago now, where they looked at the city of London and two different ways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from transportation. 
One is more efficient vehicles. Um, and the other is replacing some car travel with walking and cycling, particularly for short trips. So if you only were thinking about CO2 emissions, if you were really focused pretty narrowly on climate change, you'd see um, really within the error bars of the study, the same reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, 35%, 38%. That's a great big contribution to climate change. But look down here at the second consideration, which is a reduction in premature deaths per million people. Um, there's an improvement in both cases. Uh, for more efficient vehicles, um, it means some reduction in, in air pollution. But look at the benefits of people having safe access to what they call active transportation, right? Using um, our own bodies to walk around or cycle to where we need to be. Um, the re reduction in chronic illness that would come from that in the city of London is many, many times bigger. Um, so one first key thing to remember about multi-solving is not all climate solutions um, are, are considered equal really when it comes to their multi-solving co-benefits. Now, the co-benefits of multi-solving fit into lots of different categories. And so we're offering this idea we call flower to help you have a kind of quick checklist in your mind of the different co-benefits. Um, flower stands for the framework for long-term whole system equity-based reflection. You'll find lots about it on our website and, and connections to that um, in, the, in the learn platform. Um, but for now, let's just focus on these six different categories of co-benefits. We'll start at the top and just go around the circle. So first one, food and water. Um, so some solutions to climate change increase people's access to healthy food or food security, food, uh, the yield of crops or increase access to clean water. Um, biodiversity really would probably fit in this pedal too. Next one, jobs and assets. We talk so much about all of the jobs that will, will be need to be created to build the infrastructure of a clean enemy, uh, clean energy economy. Um, those jobs could build wealth in um, communities that haven't always had access to good jobs. Then there's health, well-being, and safety. That's this red petal of the flower down here. Um, we already talked about air pollution. We talked about active transportation. So many ways that getting off of fossil fuels improves people's health. Connection, this is sometimes is called social cohesion. Um, people knowing their neighbors, people building political solidarity together. We can approach much of what we need to do to address climate change in ways that also connects our communities. And that pays off in people's well-being. Uh, over here, this orange petal, energy, industry, and mobility. Um, so think about the uh, disability to get to jobs and school and hospitals. Um, are there ways to do that that don't require you to afford a vehicle and have a, a driver's license? Many climate solutions can open up mobility or open up access to people um, who may, may not have access to the standard energy infrastructure right now. And then finally, this yellow petal we think of as resilience. So these are the solutions that simultaneously reduce greenhouse gas emissions and make communities um, better adapted to climate impacts or other shocks. So those are, the, those are the six categories. There probably are other co-benefits that, that don't fit neatly here, but in the research we've done, we find that most examples of multi-solving we study, um, you can find the co-benefits fitting into these, these six petals. Um, and because flower is a helpful way to think about multi-solving, um, one thing that we've done is create a really simple paper and pencil exercise you can see elementary school age kids here um, using the flower exercise. What you do is you, you think of an example, it might be a project you wanna undertake as a group and you use the diagram and colored pencils to say, well, we think this one would, would definitely give us some food and water um, protections. We think it would improve health and safety. So you color in the petals um, where those co-benefits fit. And then you can also think about how could we add more co-benefits to, um, to a project that we might undertake. So we, don't, we obviously don't have uh, colored pencils and paper. We're not sitting in a room together like these kids, but we can, um, we can try out flower together as a little interactive exercise using Poll Everywhere, which you all are used to from prior webinars. Remember, here's the link and I bet someone will put it in the chat. So what we're gonna do is 
quite quickly look at two different examples from a library of case studies we've built at Climate Interactive about multi-solving. Um, so I'm going to explain this case study and then we're going to go to a poll everywhere where you'll see a flower diagram that you can click on and you should just click on whichever petals, whichever benefits you think this project would, would help um, contribute to. So the first one is called the Baltimore Orchard Project. So it's the US city of Baltimore. And it's a project um, that planted more than a thousand different fruit and nut trees um, in a quite an urban environment. So Baltimore is a big city um, in nearly a hundred different orchards. So clusters of these um, fruit trees and nut trees in neighborhoods. Um, it was done with community labor and helped train people to plant and take care of trees. Um, much of the food that was produced, the fruits and the nuts, were shared with food pantries, so people who could have access um, to fresh fruits in a neighborhood where it's difficult to reach grocery stores um, for fresh fruits and vegetables sometime. So um, that's the Baltimore Orchard Project. And then now if we go to the poll, um, all right, it's working. So you all are already putting lots of dots on there. I'm seeing food, water, definitely, right? We said filling the food pantries, jobs and assets, people were being trained, health and well being, um, food security is a key part of being healthy, uh, connection. That's definitely true. M many um, community groups and churches and synagogues work together in this project. Uh, a few clicks on energy industry and mobility, maybe not quite so much. Resilience, um, definitely people are thinking probably about the ways in which trees help um, counteract the urban heat island effect, which gets worse with climate change and how trees help prevent flooding by slowing the flow of water. Um, and Baltimore is a place where they're experiencing more flooding um, with climate change. And then a lot of you are putting dots in the center, which is awesome. Um, that means that for the long term, you're also seeing this project helping protect the climate. And probably that's the, uh, the amount of carbon that trees are sequestering. Um, energy might be uh, because um, a cooler neighborhood, people are going to need to use less energy for cooling their homes and their businesses. Great. So I think you got the hang of flower. Um, so let's go back and look at one more case study. This one um, is actually a very old example. I think this project started in 1974. It's been replicated in cities around the world. Some of you might have experienced this, but the original project is called Ciclovia. It is in Bogota in Colombia. Um, and Erin, weekends and holidays, they close many miles of roads throughout the city and they open them up for families, for people on bicycles, roller skating. Um, and it's an, it's an initiative that was meant to bring the community together, build people's health, help people get around without cars on those days when it's safe to be on the streets. Um, and this is an incredibly successful project that many, many places now have replicated. So let's quickly zoom over to, to flower again. Um, and what we're going to do is just do it as a second poll. Um, so go ahead and if you have access to this new blank flower, uh, even if you clicked before thinking you were clicking on the cycling one, try it on here. I am not seeing dots appear. Anybody know why that might be? Yes, for um, even when you hit next, it didn't activate. So. If folks could go back and try again, yes, I've, I activated it too. Okay, I think we had a little glitch there. Hopefully now you can. All right, I'm gonna keep us moving because I think you got the hand with the first, the hang of it with the first time. Sorry about that folks. Um, all right, what we wanna do is now make a quick transition from the, the idea of multi-solving, which I think you've, you've got a feeling for, um, to talk about how we might use multi-solving in En-ROADS. And really the rest of the hour, we're going to be showing you different ways to basically get your hooks into um, multi-solving in En-ROADS. So I'm gonna leave the slides and we're gonna go to En-ROADS, um, make En-ROADS a little bigger for you. So the first thing is that on any, really any slide 
um, slider in En-ROADS, you can begin to think about what the connections might be to multi-solving. So let's just pick one. Um, let's pick energy efficiency of transportation and we'll, we'll do a scenario. Imagine I'm talking to a group and they're interested in things like more efficient vehicles, um, public transportation, walking and cycling, all the things that get people moved more miles for less units of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so what I want you to do is think about, and then we're going to go back to pull everywhere and type into the box some co-benefits of what you think that particular slider would create. Okay, so um, let's go to the poll. We'll go to the next poll. Um, and I'll make it a little bigger. All right, so as soon as you have access to that box, start typing in what else might get better besides climate change with more efficient vehicles, more walking, more cycling. Uh, and we're gonna just create together uh, a, a word cloud of the things that are gonna get better with more efficient transportation. And look at that, like right away, we're seeing health as a huge one. And of course that's because of less air pollution, um, but also because of more physical activity, less PM 2.5, right? That's the small particles that lodge in our lungs. Um, uh, my legs, love it. Um, community, people are walking through their neighborhoods. I'm looking for economic vitality. Uh, many studies actually show when people walk through a business district, there's just more walk-in traffic to small businesses. Great, so I love it. Um, let's just, let's do one more. Um, so let's go back to En-ROADS for a second. And I wanna show you one more, uh, one more resource that's for you. If you click on the, the bring up more information and then the I for info and you scroll down a little bit, you'll see potential coal, potential co-benefits of encouraging energy efficiency. So all the things that we just typed in the word cloud, they're also here for you um, to prompt your memory. Uh, and you'll see later equity considerations, which Cassandra's gonna talk about in just a minute. And if you scroll all the way down, um, you'll also see some case studies. So links to uh, research about the co-benefits that come from, in this case, transport energy efficiency. Um, let's, let's just uh, to keep practicing, Let's do, let's pick one more um, slider and we'll do that same word cloud. So this time, let's say we're gonna re reduce deforestation. Um, so around the world, there's forests that are protected and let's create the same word cloud. First, I'm gonna clear that last one. And as soon as you're able to start adding all right, so health, biodiversity, right? Think of all the things, other species that live in those forests, clean air, trees and other plants, helping our air quality, our health, indigenous peoples um, whose traditional lands are protected, equity, fresh water, ecotourism, right? And biodiversity, super, super large in that one. Um, okay, so that's the like the first layer into thinking about um, the sliders and how you can connect them um, to, uh, to multi-solving and to co-benefits. Um, the next thing that we want to talk about is basically using the outputs. So if the sliders are inputs, you can hook them to multi-solving. You can also use um, the, the, some of the graphs and some are more useful than others. So I wanna orient you to some of my favorite outputs in En-ROADS to talk about multi-solving. Okay. Um, the first one is down here under impacts and we're gonna look at air pollution from energy. And I wanna also compare that to another impact. So I'm gonna bring up the temperature graph here. And let's just do um, a scenario with a carbon price um, and let's add in some energy efficiency and we still have some uh, deforestation protection. Okay, so what you're looking at here is air pollution from energy, PM 2.5. This is the small particles that come from the burning of fossil fuels. And look at that climate scenario has produced 
so much less PM 2.5 emissions, right? So when we were typing health into the word cloud, this was one of the big reasons behind that. Now, here's a second point about multi-solving you can illustrate with these two graphs. Um, look how quickly air pollution improves after we institute our policy around 2020. That curve is pretty much going straight down. Look over here at temperature. We know this, right? We know the lags in the climate system. Um, you don't really see the black line and the blue line diverging until you know, the 2040s out here. So when you think about people trying to create action, you think about political leaders who need to show results for, uh, for spending that they've, they've invested in, um, one, one real advantage of multi-solving is it allows you to bring shorter term benefits in to complement the longer term climate protection. Uh, one other thing to know if you wanna explore this air pollution graph, um, we also have it broken out um, to show where the air pollution is coming from, which types um, which types of energy sources. So we're back to the business as usual, and this is coal, right? So again, we've seen the importance of coal, um, not only for climate change, but also for, um, for health and air pollution. All right, what are a couple other places that we can look at co-benefits? Um, the, the next ones are a little bit of an exercise in uh, helping people mentally simulate connections. So one of the ones that I like to use is here is um, renewables primary energy demand. And let's, um, let's help that improve. Here we go. Um, maybe we'll give it a little bit of a carbon price too. And so we don't have a graph to show jobs um, from renewables at this point but it's a pretty easy extrapolation for people to make in their minds. So what I might say if I was with a group is think about our communities, what kind of building and construction is gonna to have to be created to change this renewable energy, um, to meet that renewable energy demand. And people begin to think about all the jobs in building um, clean energy infrastructure. So you, could, you can, for many graphs and en roads, this is really just an example, you can segue from um, a behavior of a certain type of energy to talk about how that might play out in a community. Um, let's, let's look at maybe one last place. Um, I like to sometimes talk about total primary energy. We could talk about improving energy efficiency of um, homes and buildings and factories and, and also um, transportation. Uh, so here you see this, this, this reduction in energy demand. And what you wanna help people imagine is what's changing on the ground in your communities to have that curve go down. And so you have people picturing more efficient homes. You can picture people on fixed incomes who now have to spend less of their paycheck on their utility bills. So that's a way you can move from this very global total primary energy output on En-ROADS to bring multi-solving in um, to, your, uh, to your conversations with people. Um, the, the last resource I'm going to name on this topic for you is a, a one sheet slide that we've built that shows for uh, each of the En-ROADS um, sliders some of the key co-benefits to think about. So you can have this as a handout with groups or you can just use it to um, jog your own memory. So that's the first layer. And now we wanna go a little bit deeper and I'm gonna pass it to Cassandra to talk about um, why we think equity is such an important part of multi-solving and of your En-ROADS facilitation. Great. Um, so as um, has already been discussed in the chat that some of these actions can have unequal impacts. Um, we know that marginalized individuals tend to suffer the biggest burden of climate change while contributing the least to the dynamics that cause climate change. And so when we're talking about policies that can create co-benefits, we also need to be mindful about how those co-benefits are distributed. So who is benefiting the most from these policies? Is an afforestation policy um, planting trees in neighborhoods that already have them? or are they planting them in um, areas that currently suffer from something called urban heat island effect? Uh, as well as um, these, some of these actions can create worsening inequalities. So when we shut down coal plants, people lose their jobs. 
So there are two kinds of equity considerations here. How are these benefits being distributed in an equitable way? And what are some of the unintended impacts and consequences that could come from a policy? And so I think we can go to En-ROADS now and um, test some of those out. And so first we, I wanna, um, let's move the afforestation slider. So let's say we afforested the, uh, did a large afforestation projects. And then um, Beth, you wanna show the land for CO2 removal. Yep. Um, one down. Yeah, yep. get her down. No, that's, not, sorry, hang on. So this dotted line right here is represents the area under it represents the landmass of India. So when we are talking about some large afforestation um, programs, we need to think about what um, might be some unintended consequences and equity considerations that could displace people. Traditionally, you know, in, indigenous individuals have had land rights taken away from them under the guise of development or um, you know policies. And so you need to make sure and be mindful of how a project that seemingly can do a lot of good might also create um, worsening inequalities. Another really great entry point to talk about equity in En-ROADS is looking at the cost of energy graph. So if we in, apply a carbon price, as many folks advocate for, that cost of energy goes up very high. So wonder how is that carbon price being applied? Is the burden being felt by the producers of fossil fuels or consumers? Uh, there are ways to kind of counteract this as we showed earlier, when you increase the energy efficiency of buildings and industry, there's a lot less energy being used. So as the cost of energy could go up, people's energy consumption could go down and things could equal out, but that won't happen by accident. We need to be really intentional when we're talking about these policies and as well as designing them. And then I think a final um, impact that we can look at, and again, these are not exhaustive lists. Uh, there's um, in each slider, they have these lists of co-benefits and equity considerations. And so there are many, many different ways to make these points and um, bring equity into your En-ROADS facilitation but it's really about kind of matching your audience and more your local situation. You can talk about local policies. So if we wanna to go to temperature change, I think we've been seeing some pretty bad heat waves all around the world. And so when we think about this increasing temperature, we know that the world isn't getting warmer equally. There's places that are warming much more rapidly uh, such as Alaska and there's, you know, the Inuit indigenous folks there. So. Um, thinking about how these sliders will impact temperature change, who is really going to be suffering the brunt of heat waves, et cetera, and talking about that in your En-ROADS facilitation. Do you have anything to add, Beth? Um, no, maybe just to remind folks one more time, if you're looking to jog your memory, just the, the info button is your friend. And if you scroll down a bit, you'll find equity considerations. So I'll take us back to the slides, Cassandra. Mm -hmm. And so these are just some of the um, ones I just went over. And similar to the co-benefits one page guide that Beth showed you earlier, we have designed one for equity considerations as well. And both of those can be found on the website and in the materials attached to this module and the learning platform. And so now we're gonna go into a brief breakout room exercise. I'm going to show a policy on the next page and I'll also read it. And you're gonna think about this policy. And when you go to your breakout rooms, discuss what are the co-benefits of this policy? What are some equity considerations? Meaning how can this be a good thing for equity and improve equity? But also are there any unintended consequences that need to be mind that you one needs to be mindful of? And then finally, try and think about which En-ROAD sliders might be connected to this policy. So this, imagine there's a program that's building solar powered, so renewable microgrids in a rural area 
that currently doesn't really have electricity or any good energy stores. Microgrids um, are these units that can either be attached to the regular electric power grid or can stand alone. They can be powered by fossil fuels or alternative energy sources. So for the purpose of this policy, imagine it is a microgrid that's by itself powered by solar, bringing clean electricity to homes that did not currently have electricity. And so now we can go to the breakout groups. All right, I think we are all back. All right, thanks, Ellie. Um, let's just go right back to our slides. Um, so we're gonna we're we're almost done that through the hour. I hope you had a good time in the small groups. The ones we listened to sounded like they were going great. And we're just gonna go deeper in this same theme, other ideas for how to bring multi-solving and equity into your facilitation and some of the ways you can customize it. Um, so the first thing, and we really urge you to spend some time at this, is find stories of multi solving that resonate for your audience. So think about your sector, your country, um, what's on people's minds. And we have some resources on the Climate Interactive website that you can draw on. Um, if you just go to topics and multi solving, you'll find this section called practices and tools, and it's full of case studies. There's a section of 10 that are about the intersections of health and climate. Uh, there's four that are about uh, climate resilience and climate mitigation and how those can be combined. Um, there's a GREAT database, which stands for the Green, Resilient, and Equitable Actions for Transformation. This is the most current um, set of case studies. These are ways that countries are spurring economic recovery from COVID-19 while also featuring climate action that has an equity lens to it. And it's full of examples from all around the world. So, Check that out. If someone wants to throw the link in the chat, that would be great from the CI team. Um, and you all have a challenge in this module to uh, encourage you to, um, to, to do just this, the search for stories. Cassandra, do you want to say a couple words about that? Yes. So um, as part of the multi-solving module, we asked folks to kind of pick a story from their local news and report back in the community space. And I've been checking them out the last couple of days. And they're really, I just, I'm blown away. Um, people are really getting it and they're um, just grasping the multi-solving concept amazingly. One of them almost moved me to tears. So thank you for the folks that have done it already. And I strongly encourage the folks that haven't checked out the module and done the challenge to do that and share in the community space because it's just really inspiring. Great, yeah, check it out. Uh, another thing you can do, we already modeled this in the beginning of the hour. So before moving a slider, ask for thoughts about co-benefits and equity. Um, you, we find you need to prompt people um, that and in general, we're not trained to think about climate change and everything else that comes with it. But if you get people thinking, if you lead with examples, um, we find it can come pretty naturally. We've also, in some of the uh, exercises that we've designed, we have hooks built in. Um, uh, one of them is, I think you'll learn more about this next week, but in the climate action uh, simulation experience, there's some slides that say multi-solving lens and they ask folks to think about a co-benefit from a proposal that um, an individual or a group might wanna make. Um, so we ask, we ask people to name a co-benefit we also ask them to name a consideration about how to, or a, really a way to address potential inequities in whatever proposal it is that they're making. Um, while you're moving levers, if you're doing a more informal creating a scenario together, say things like, imagine we really push this En-ROADS lever in our community. Are there dangers of inequities being increased? or how would we need to design that action so the burdens and benefits were shared in an equitable way? So you can do this in the way that feels natural to you, but the, the key point is to add in to your, first your thinking and then your facilitation to just always be asking these questions about co-benefits and equity. Um, here's a time where you really can customize it to your groups is in the debriefs that you plan after an experience with En-ROADS. Um, one powerful way 
is to actually leave the climate frame for a minute and start with other things that are on people's minds. I like saying, what are some of the most intractable problems in our community or our sector, our country, depending on who you've gathered together? And then the challenge for the group is, how could they address whatever that was, you know, maybe it was poverty, maybe it was asthma, um, whatever comes up from that group, with creativity, people can usually find a climate action that could also help address that problem. Um, and then you can open this question of collaboration. Who would we have to be as groups or individuals or who would we have to connect with um, to bring these two problems together? So the debrief gives you a lot of opportunities to bring in multi-solving and equity. Um, those are some of the ways that um, we like to do it. And Cassandra is going to speak to what we've learned by watching other facilitators who are exper experimenting and coming up with their own ways to do this. So um, Cassandra, why don't you share some of the, the other things that people are coming up with? Sure. So um, one of the ones that I was really intrigued by was a Enroads Climate Ambassador named Tony Green. He ran it in two sessions. So he had his first, you know, En-ROADS about an hour long, your traditional standard workshop that everyone here is learning how to run. And then a uh, part two, in which he introduced the concept of multi-solving. And he hardly went into <clears throat> the simulation at all. Rather, he highlighted the sliders that folks chose and talked about the most in the first session, and then dug deeper in them in the second session. And I thought that was really interesting because there can be a challenge depending on how much time you have to really um, tease out some of these deeper insights. Another approach, um, one that I've done a few times now when I've done uh, En-ROADS demos is, you know, we, we learn to get to two degrees Celsius. We're driving to two degrees Celsius. And you realize pretty early on that one must move pretty much nearly every single lever to get us still below two degrees Celsius. And so if you only have 20 minutes or an hour and you're presenting to an audience that is more rooted in justice and social justice, climate equity, et cetera, then perhaps don't try to get to two degrees Celsius because you're not gonna have time to dig deeper and look at co-benefits and equity considerations for all of the 18 sliders in 20 minutes. So kind of go in picking a few that you know would be really useful for your community, for local projects, and dig into them and see the effects in the graphs and such, rather than just trying to get that number to below two degrees Celsius. We've also seen similar to what um, Beth had just mentioned of asking folks what is a problem in their community. Um, you could start with that instead of ending with it. So we saw Kurt Newton, another ambassador, um, start with a word cloud and said, what are the biggest social justice issues in your community? and started with that and then brought it into multi-solving. Great, um, thanks Cassandra. Um, so that is uh, what we really wanted to share in this time that we had. And so to close it, what we thought we would do, it'd be useful to us to hear what are you taking away from this session? Um, and then a second question when you think about the people you plan to engage with En-ROADS, what are some of the multi-solving benefits and equity considerations that you think will be most important? Um, and so for feedback for us, but also so you all can see as a community um, what you're taking away and what you're thinking about, we're gonna do two final word clouds and then we'll open up the chat for Q&A for um, the time that we have left. I'm gonna take us back to the uh, to the poll. Um, let's see. Okay, so hopefully you all now see the question, what are some key takeaways of this session for you? Engagement, yay. Hopefully multi-solving is a great way to increase your engagement. You're thinking about the sliders, you're thinking about communities. Imagining what's possible maybe. 
us. I like that. Multi-solving is definitely about us and about community and about co-benefits. Fantastic. Cassandra, I think we communicated what we hoped to communicate, just seeing all these really important and positive ideas float by. Um, yay, somebody please grab a screenshot. I wanna hang this on my wall. Let's do, um, <laughs> let's do one more poll. When you think about the people you plan to engage with En-ROADS, what are some of the multi-solving benefits or equity considerations that you think will be most important? And go ahead and put both of them. Uh, we'll just let them all mingle together. Jobs, for sure. Equity, racial justice, well-being, asthma, pollution, community empowerment, marginalized, affordable fairness. I love seeing fairness. I was um, recently at a meeting where they commissioned a study about how best to talk about equity, climate change, and health. And one thing, one finding was fairness is a really great word. Equity um, is very identified, at least in the US, with progressive communities. Fairness is a more far-reaching term. So thinking about your audience, you might remember that jobs, justice, air, health, well-being, bills. This is great. So these are all the things and more um, that you really can, can uh, throw into your facilitation with En-ROADS and customize it to fit your audiences and your communities. I'm gonna end it even though there's great stuff coming in still and let's just, uh, I'll stop sharing my screen and uh, we're very close to the end of the hour, but Cassandra and I can stay for um, a few minutes of questions. And we have an optional breakout group at the end for the folks who really have energy for this. I don't, did we pick anyone to monitor the, the chat? Yes, so um, we've been responding intermittently. And now if folks want to put in questions specifically about the topics that we covered today, I can read them out loud, Beth and try and answer as many as possible. And then, you know, other folks on our team can be responding in the chat. Perfect. So one person did ask this from at the beginning when we were showing flour and um, you mentioned that biodiversity might fit in the food and water petal. Somebody is asking why is biodiversity not, it wouldn't be its own separate petal. Yeah, that's a good question. And we're talking about um, all alternatives right now. One thing I would say is that, because uh, one of the things on Cassandra's uh, plate right now is a revision of flower to make it more useful, more helpful. So send us any thoughts you have on that and where to fit biodiversity is one thing we're, we're thinking about. Personally, it's the symmetry of six simple petals is, is one thing in there. Um, There's um, not really more questions. People are just lots of thank yous. Good, yeah, well, we are at the end of the time. Um, you all can find us or you have those uh, links for support and questions. We thought um, some of you might enjoy breakout groups and we thought we could do them in a different way this time, um, which is based on the six different sets of co-benefits in Flower. So I believe Yazzie has set us up to be able to choose a, Choose a breakout group if you want to visit with folks for five or 10 minutes. Um, otherwise, thanks so much for your time and we'll see you next week. Great, and if you are interested in joining a breakout room um, and you're in Zoom, click on the button for breakout rooms and that will give you an ability to select one. Um, so you can select health, jobs, resilience, and go to that breakout room. Uh, just hover over the number of people in the room and it'll say join and you can join it there. Yeah, some of you all are figuring it out. And also feel free to hang out in the main room. We'll stick around and uh, happy to have some discussion here in the main room, but um, yeah, we'll tr try the breakout rooms if people are interested.
see a question in the chat, Beth. Someone says, can you say more about the use of the word fairness rather than equity? Yeah, and I should preface this by saying this was really a study focused in the US, so I don't know how it would apply in other places. Um, but the researchers from a communications firm were, the, the question they were being asked was, um, how could these intersections of climate change, health, and equity um, be used to build a wider coalition for action, at the, especially at the state and local level? And so they scanned messaging like op-eds and radio programs. Um, and they, they were looking to see, you know, where did their messaging get traction? And one of the observations was that um, fairness uh, seems to, to be able to convey these ideas that everyone should benefit from the clean energy transition, that no group should be unfairly burdened. Um, that fairness can open those conversations with people where equity um, might make someone not as engaged. I just thought that was interesting. Someone also asked um, that we have a range of participants from you know around the world, but that they're seeing a lot of white folks and just kind of pose the question about how could we get more wider range of diversity of folks involved in this? I don't think there is one right answer, but I thought you could yeah. that. And is that you think they're asking as En-ROADS users and ambassadors? Is that what I that think the, that they mean ambassadors? Yeah. But please correct me in the chat if I'm wrong. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I would just say a general principle um, of all of this work is to think about what are the what are the barriers and what are the supports to make things accessible to as many people as possible. Um, and so in climate work in general, I know lots of attention just goes to um, are you hosting your meetings at times that people who have a nine to five job are able to attend or not? Are there financial barriers in the way? Um, in the case of the En-ROADS training, we're really conscious, you know, there's, there's eight one hour webinars and a lot of modules and a lot of time. So someone um, who's facing economic hardship may not have time to do things like that. Uh, so ideas for further improvement as we self-reflect are like, could there be scholarships or financial support or other ways to reduce barriers? And, and we're also always open to ideas and input from folks. So let us know what, what you think. Yeah, and in the follow-up email today, you'll actually see a link um, to a feedback survey. We're, we're just kind of want to have this general principle of continuous learning and wanting to continuously improve. So if you have ideas, uh, we're always welcome to hear them, whether in the survey or just tell us so you can reach out to us anytime. Um, I see another question here, Beth, are there examples of equity considerations that worked in pre the presentations to show groups um, how communities have applied or are apl applying fairness and solutions? Um, yeah, I think you'll see if you look at our case studies, um, we try to highlight that in places. And so, you know, one example of that would be um, many energy efficiency home weatherization programs around the world are targeted towards um, homeowners of a certain income threshold. And the reason for that is that um, what's called the energy burden, the percent of someone's income they pay for utilities is higher um, the lower your income is, right? Like it takes the same amount of energy to heat your house, no matter how much money you earn, but it's a bigger percentage of a smaller paycheck. So many states and municipalities are um, targeting energy efficiency programs to really try to, to tighten up the homes of people on low incomes. So that would be, you could apply that across many areas, not just um, energy efficiency, but um, Tar so targeting the programs toward marginalized groups. Um, think of job training programs for the clean energy economy that aim towards uh, people who may not have had access to those jobs in the past. Um, the, the flip side, so there's targeting. And then the other one is to make sure that you're not um, investing your programs to benefit people who are the most well off. So at least in the US, one conversation is about things like subsidies for rooftop solar for households. 
And often those are only available if you own your home. If you're a renter, you can't access those programs. So they're uh, an incentive for the clean energy economy, if you're not careful, benefits people who are already well off. So those are the two things, like can you target it towards groups who may have lacked access? And can you make sure you're not just sending benefits to places where already there are a lot of benefits? Great, um, let's see, I may have missed something in the chat. Um, Thank you all for sticking around. If there's anything you, specifically that you'd like to, um, you'd like us to speak to, feel free to drop it in and we can speak to it. I see Laura's asking about a video on the COVID assumptions that we've added to En-ROADS. And Laura, I'm looking around for that. I can't remember whether we post, posted something or not, um, but I will email you if I can find that. Um, Michelle mentions, how can we make mining and manufacturing more equitable in terms of carrying the burden of industrial pollution? Yeah, what a great question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and that's where also, um, well, so I'd say a few, a few things. One is thinking really broadly about multi-solving. So for instance, any principles of the circular economy, which mean we, we would need to do less mining because we're doing such a good job at recycling and reusing materials like um, you know, the lithium that's in um, batteries, for instance. Like the better we can do at um, reusing, the less pressure there is on extraction which means the less pressure on the communities where extraction happens. But of course, the other principle is local control. Um, one thing that is really important in multi-solving and equity is who makes the decisions. Um, and in general, if the people who need to live with the waste of extraction are the ones making the decisions, um, extraction will be done in a cleaner way. It's, it's basically in systems thinking, we call that just closing a feedback loop. Well, thanks. And, and Beth Alexandra, I'm curious, uh, you all have been looking a lot at different examples of how policies related to economic recovery around COVID um, do and do not have different multi-solving components. Could you speak to some of the kind of things that you all are seeing there? Like what are some of those, uh, or like any interesting examples that might be uh, worth sharing with, with us? Yeah, let's have, Cassandra, you want to talk about that since it's so much of your research? Looks like Cassandra's on the move. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, sorry, I had to relocate, but um, can you just repeat the last part of that question, Ellie? I yeah, I was just curious. I'll start off and you can have a second to think, Cassandra. Ellie asked about our research on COVID um, responses that are also multi-solving. Um, so Cassandra could maybe name a couple examples that are really interesting. Um, one question that I've, I've had, and Cassandra's done some of the math on this, is of the, it's now up to 17 trillion. When we started this research, it was 15 trillion. Around the world, $17 trillion have been spent on COVID economic recovery. Um, and we were wondering what percentage of that also focuses on climate and then climate plus equity. Um, there are, there are other groups who are tracking this spending really carefully. So we were able to look at some of their databases and I'll just give my, my rough impression, Cassandra might have the numbers more at her fingertips. But if you look at um, uh, spending that could go toward energy, less than half is going toward clean energy. And then within that, if you look at what percentage also has some screen for equity, like racial equity, gender equity, or economic equity, um, uh, a much smaller percentage of that, so that around 10% or something would really meet what we would say is multi-solving. So it's a shame because there's a tremendous potential um, for, for just for um, comparison. Other estimates say that it's about 1.4 trillion a year to be on a path compliant with the Paris Agreement um, globally. So 17 trillion is a lot um, and a small percentage of it could really help our climate goals and our equity goals. 
but so far the world isn't really seizing that opportunity fully. Yes. Um, and I would add that at the same time, some of these policies that I've been tracking that you could find in the great database, even if the, we're not doing enough on a global scale, some local communities are really doing some extraordinary things with very limited resources. And I am very impressed and in awe of the way that communities have really come together to enact policies and programs that are green increase resilience, increase equity in the face of the crisis of COVID-19. Um, there's so many, there's too many to name, so I'm not gonna try and rattle them off, but I really encourage um, folks to check out that database. If nothing else, to just find little blips of hope in a time when we get a lot of negative climate news. Well, thanks. Cassandra, do you, can you think of just like one off the top of your head that has stood out to you? I, I'm just so fascinated. Sure. I know that a lot of people, when we mentioned Ciclovia, uh, people were like chiming in in the chat about how exciting the, the, they had heard of it or seen other examples of yeah. similar. So and, there's so much to learn from this. Could somebody, maybe Yazzie, could you drop in the link to the op-ed that Beth and I wrote in the Hill? The, that does a really good job of kind of teasing out some of our favorite examples and um, discussing them a bit more. But uh, one of my favorites is in Nigeria, the Rural Electrification Agency there is partnering with the World Bank and the African Development Bank to install rural mi solar powered microgrids in areas currently without electricity. So that policy that I, you guys use in your breakout groups, I actually took that idea from that policy. Um, in Ireland, the July jobs stimulus was the name of the package. And it really emphasized weatherization and energy efficiency of homes for jobs going to marginalized youth. It's just really designed very thoughtfully and comprehensively. It's not just energy efficiency of buildings. It tackles a lot of things. Um, and then there's actually one that I was working on yesterday that will be on the website soon in Jordan. Um, and uh, th that's also just a very comprehensive project. But yeah, check out that um, op-ed because we kind of touched on the range of how folks are doing it. Great. Thanks, Cassandra. Does that feel like we hit most of the questions in the chat? Actually, yeah. Beth, sorry, I just saw one that I think is really important and um, I'm, we could send the NPQ article for it. Somebody said, it's great when benefits can be shared but what happens when you get diverse values? How might you address conflict and what is being valued through multi-solving? Which I think is very important and good question. Yeah. Um, yeah, a whole other side to our work that we didn't have time to talk about today is um, how multi-solving happens, which I think this question is getting at. Um, and so both by looking at these bright spots, the examples that we've been sharing, and also uh, collaborating with others in multi-solving projects, we're trying to learn about um, uh, how this happens. If, if there are these amazing bright spots, but they're rare, we really wanna share with the world what, are the, what makes it different to do a multi-solving project. And one of the key differences is it's a very relationship-based way of working. Um, so you bring people together across all of these different sectors and silos. And the most important first thing that happens is building trusting relationships together, um, which takes time, it takes listening. Um, it doesn't look like a lot of action at first is our observation. Um, but it's in that process that those differing values come forth. Um, but what I've observed is that with enough time and listening, things that may have started out as conflicts of values um, somehow get worked out. You know, this project we were involved in in Atlanta, um, there were neighborhood groups and officials from the city who were really quite um, in opposition to each other or because of uh, flooding problems that it felt like the city was creating on some low income neighborhoods. And something in the process, and it took a couple years of uh, forming explicitly a set of shared values turned those relationships much less ad adversarial. Um, it's not easy, but I really think it is possible. Yeah. 
Thanks everyone for sticking around and for your good questions. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks everyone. Um, thanks for all the rich discussion too. When I jumped into the breakout rooms earlier, uh, I love just kind of hearing all the different things that were coming up um, as people were talking about microgrids. I think we are done here and we have closed out the breakout sessions. I hope those had some good conversations as people jumped into different topical areas. Um, and again, we'll po post the recording and send you all an email afterwards. Thanks for joining us today and um, take care out there in this wild world we're in. Bye everyone. Thanks Bye, everybody. Bye.